Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a live Q&A with director Chad Hardigan discussing his new feature, Little Fish, offered courtesy of IFC Films, opening in theaters and on demand uh, beginning February 5th. So, uh, Chad, welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in. So I, I'm sure you hear this a lot, but this is really one of those moments where uh, life imitates art. And uh, uh, it's, it's really nice to see something that I think sort of addresses a lot of things that we're going through, but in a way that makes you feel very um, connected to a beautiful romance and you know characters as opposed to absolutely terrified like the amount of us that watched Contagion when the pandemic started. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd love to know a little bit about uh, where you got started with the, the concept of neuroinflammatory uh, affliction, because is, I mean, is that, is that rooted in something uh, real or is that a, a sort of a modification of diseases that are out there? Well, uh, I can't take credit for it because the, the movie's based on a short story written by a girl named Asia Gable. And uh, it's, a, it's much different from the final product, but still about a, a, a young couple dealing with this fictional disease in a, in a global pandemic uh, uh, where you forget your memories. And um, so you would have to ask her about the origins of it. But I, I imagine that she, yeah, sort of started from a place of um, thinking about something like dementia or Alzheimer's and, um, imagining that in younger people, because I, I think what, when we think of those diseases, we tend to think of them for older people and it's easy to think, oh, you know, that's sad that they're forgetting um, their past, but you don't really think about how it's also robbing them of any future. Um, and I thought it was interesting to, to recontextualize that type of disease and really show that not only is it causing you to forget your past, but because of that, it's also inhibiting any chance of building something new and moving forward. How um, how, how different is the short uh, the short story from the script? It's pretty different, um, and now it's been you know two two years since I've read it. It actually just got posted today on Entertainment Weekly, so people can check it out and read it. Um, before that, it wasn't available to the public. Um, and, you know, the, the, the central conceit and, and that the, the focus on one couple uh, is, is pretty much all that Matson, the screenwriter, took from the short story and ran with it. Um, it he, he invented a lot of the specifics and also uh, sort of threw out a lot of her bigger bigger scale tangents. Uh, he decided smartly, I think, to focus on just the couple and uh, get glimpses of the outside world via their POV only. So only stuff that directly affects them or that they would see on TV is what you get uh, what, what you get to know about the outside world. Um, so, Give us a sense a little bit of, of the structure and, and whether or not the, the film ultimately matches, you know, sort of the, any sense of temporal linearity or if you, um, if you played around with it, because some of the beauty of the film really is in its uh, ability to take you back and forth in time and obviously uh, make you think twice about what you've seen and how it fits in. Yeah. It was written in the script to be nonlinear and jump back and forth in time. Uh, but very early on, I decided with my cinematographer, Sean, who's a lifelong friend and, and someone I've worked with constantly, that uh, the approach we, we wanted to take was to not have any strong visual marker to let you know whether you were in the present or the past or a false version of the past. And even though we do some techniques, generally speaking, we wanted it all to kind of flow together and be a little bit um, discombobulating. And, and at the end of the movie, if you thought back on it, 
uh, it would ideally feel like one long continuous memory or, or dream or thought. So that meant when we shot it, uh, it, it opened up even more possibilities in the editing room for moving stuff around, uh, taking something that may have been intended to be in the present and, and re-editing it so it was now something from the past. And, uh, you know, it's a blessing and a curse that we could have cut the movie a, a million different ways. Uh, and we did have a lot of fun trying all kinds of crazy experiments. And so the final product I would say is 60% the way it was structured in the script and 40% uh, like all, all over the place uh, from ways we, from stuff we found in the editing room. Not to ruin the magic, but do you feel like sharing any of the experimentations that you were working through? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I trust that everyone watching has seen it. So I, we can talk like spoilery stuff, right? Yeah, they, I mean, they, they should have had links. Uh, I mean, I know that they were sent links, but I'm hoping everyone that's here had time to watch it. Or, or they're gonna, just gonna get some spoilers. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we experimented with uh, not having the first scene of the movie be, which is the, also the last scene in the movie, not be the first scene in the movie um, and only happening at the end. We experimented with um, the, the scene of their, uh, the, the, especially the scenes with Ben and Samantha, those really could have been placed anywhere and uh, were, were written to like the first Ben and Samantha scene in the script was like on page five. And we ended up moving that much later and um, the, the procedure was earlier. Uh, so just kind of moving things around and, and, and letting the emotional journey be the thing that we were trying to really nail, uh, having a continuous arc and everything else was fair game to be moved around. Mm. I really like the chemistry between uh, Jack and Olivia. How, what, what um, drew them to you, drew you to them? Uh, I, I'm I'm a big fan of both. I, I've been a fan of Olivia since Thoroughbreds. Oh yeah, um, she really caught my eye in that. And um, Jack, uh, I saw a long time ago in This Is England, and then again in '71. And um, so big fans of both of them. Um, and you know, chemistry is is something that's always a question mark. You know, you can you can get two great actors and put them together and still end up with nothing. Uh, so I was very fortunate that they just kind of had a natural rapport. It's not like we had much rehearsal and they didn't know each other previous to working together. They just had a, a, a genuine mutual respect for each other as actors and a, a genuine excitement to get to work with the other person that I think uh, contributed to the, the ultimate chemistry. Because we we unfortunately had to start with the shoot with some of the really uh, personal, emotional stuff inside their house. It was like the house was our first location. So they really had to dive right into that stuff. And uh, it, was, it was a big relief on day one to, to just see that, it, that if nothing else, like their, their chemistry was gonna be okay. Um, so I, I, I wanted to, to bring up the, um... I wanted to bring up a film, and if you don't haven't seen it, it's called Alive Inside. Yeah. Uh, so it's a documentary about the studies going on right now, uh, linking the connection between music and memory. And it's a beautiful film, but mostly I just wanted to bring that up to talk about, um, you know, the 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 way that music sort of plays a role in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you've got musicians as characters in the film, and uh, Tell us a little bit about your own relationship to music and how you wanted it to work in the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally feel like music is one of the biggest driving factors in my nostalgia and my memories and why I consider some things to be good memories, et cetera, et cetera. And I know I'm not alone in that. Um, I'm sure that's why Matson wrote one of the characters to be a musician and and for music to play a, a narrative part in the story. Um, and then the composer of the movie is another lifelong friend of mine, Keegan, who I always work with. 
And so I, I knew I could trust him to uh, come up with something like he was tasked with coming up with score that basically um, underlined that idea of the entire movie feeling like it was one long memory or one long dream. Uh, and that's easier said than done, um, especially because if you literally had wall to wall music, that would not be good. So um, it was really important for him and I to, to find a, uh, a balance uh, of this beautiful, wistful, like melancholy, but also romantic uh, music that could play. And we had this idea that the, the entire theme of the movie is the gradual erasure of a person. And maybe we could uh, transfer that concept to the music. So he, he wrote like a theme that had a beautiful full orchestration to it. And then we could repeat it throughout the movie at different points. And maybe one time we take this instrument out uh, or one time we take this melody out. So it's the same piece, but, you know, sort of slightly degraded. Um, and so that's what we did. And I, I think the effect that it has cumulatively is, is really, uh, it goes a long way to accomplishing my goals. Um, when, you're, when you're experimenting with uh, moving pieces around, I'm curious how, how many people do you involve in that process? Because to some extent, uh, you, you wanna have both that sort of lyrical dreamlike, almost slightly ambiguous uh, feeling of you know, not being sure you know what to trust on the other hand, you also need to make something that at the end will be satisfying to someone watching it. Where, where do you look for input? How does that uh, play out? Yeah, it starts with me and the editor. And then we definitely want to branch it out. And we, you know, we're required to show the producers, so we involve them. <laughs> uh, but I have you know, lots of filmmaker friends and peers, people that I, I trust and look up to, and we'll, we'll, we do lots of screenings. And try to keep them maybe like five or six people, because anything more than that, then no matter what, you're going to get some people that are like, I like it like this. And the other person's like, I like it exactly the opposite. Um, so about five or six is a good number. And you screen it, and you listen to what they have to say. Uh, and you just, you also just feel it. You're like the more you watch it and the, the more you get uh, new eyes on it, but you're also there watching it through their new eyes. It, it just, you kind of get a gut feeling. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the process of working with the actors. Did, was there, was there a lot of uh, sort of like open collaboration? Did you guys, I mean, just because their rapport is so, is so strong in the movie. I'm, I mean, that, that's something that, yeah, you know, it can come come about in a variety of ways, but I'm I'm curious to know what your process is if you rehearse or you know. Yeah. Um, well, Olivia was on the project from the very beginning, uh, long before me. And when Matson was writing the script, adapting the short story, she was already attached, and so he was able to write with her in mind. And um, he, she says that the only input she gave him was that she wanted to speak with her real accent for once and, and be a character from Manchester. So he did that. Oh, great. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think that she probably also, you know, gave him a few other pointers too, because um, he wrote with her in mind. And then when we cast Jack, we kind of retroactively went through and with his input sort of reshaped the Jude character for him. And we didn't get a lot of rehearsal, none at all actually, but we had a few days in advance of the shoot all together in Vancouver where we could talk about the scenes, talk about the script overall, and come up with some new ideas. Uh, and that was very helpful. You know, uh, up until the last day before, we were still kind of coming up with little, little things that we thought were better. Uh, for example, Olivia and Jack uh, came up with that scene where it, it's split screen in the movie and, and they talk about the the type of memory that's exclusively tied to touch and he and he ends up like just touching her body a little bit that was they come they came up with that almost right before we started shooting and and that's a, a really lovely scene in the movie now uh, it's beautiful i t tell us i mean the, the the last time um 
when, when the last time you were on campus, unfortunately, uh, we're not there right now, but uh, for Morris, Morris from America, um, mm -hmm. which was such an amazing film, tell us a little bit about the journey between that film coming out and, and being brought on to make this film. Well, the truth is I've been on campus many times because I go to the USC library to write. No kidding. Yeah, um, I just, uh, I love the energy there. There's just nothing but like smart kids working really hard. And I try to feed off their energy when I, and I just go in the library and, and try to write stuff. So I, I, I love the USC library. Um, but the journey from Morris to this, uh, yeah, it was a long, long one because Morris came out in 2016 and this one shot in 2019. Um, right after Morris, I, I, I had opportunities open to me in, in Hollywood that I didn't expect to get after Morris. So I was, I, that's why I, I sort of shifted my focus to directing something that I didn't write. Because I was like, well, this this could be an interesting uh, opportunity for me that never comes around again. So I'm going to try and grab it. And uh, I ended up being attached to a, a project um, that did not get made, but for a long time I thought was. And I was even location scouting in Romania a few months before I thought we were going to be shooting. And then it just uh, fell apart because our our lead actor got a better role in something else. So. Um, that consumed a lot of the time. And then, uh, you know, uh, luck, lucky for me, they had, uh, the producers of Little Fish had sent me this script in the summer and I read it and liked it, but I said, I, I, I don't think I can engage with this because I'm, I've got this other thing. And then they went off and they found another director instead. And uh, that director bailed on them for almost the exact same time that my other project fell apart. And so we reconnected. And uh, I, I got to do it. And three months later, we were on the ground getting it started. So it happened very, very quickly. Um, but after a frustratingly long period trying to get another movie made. Well, was it frustrating or freeing to work uh, with uh, uh, someone else's script? Freeing, definitely uh, freeing. It was great. And I might be spoiled because the writer this is a guy named Matson Tomlin. And this is one of his first scripts to be produced, but um, he, he's already like got 10 other jobs and he co-wrote the new Batman movie that's coming out. Um, so he's well on his way to not answering my phone calls anymore. <laughs> but um, he was great, a, a, a great collaborator. Um, it was fun to bounce ideas back off of him and, and have another person to bounce ideas off of. The challenge was that uh, when you start directing movies, you don't really know how to direct movies until you do it. And so you're constantly learning and you're constantly uh, coming up against things you don't know how to do. Uh, and that's, that's, that's true that's been true for every movie for me because each movie has been bigger than the last. And so they always have new things that I haven't dealt with before. And I always drew my confidence as a director from the fact of, well, I might not know how to execute this technically, but I know the material better than anyone else. Like if someone has a question of why something is or what something should be, I do know that answer because I'm the expert of the material. I wrote it. To not be that person, uh, but have to like sort of sprint past Matson to get there very quickly was like the biggest challenge and the the strangest aspect of, of this. But um, but it was fun and he was very gracious and and by the time we were shooting, I did feel like I was the master scholar of the material. Um, I I uh, I'm curious if anyone had seen the film uh, outside of uh, your own production team. Uh, before the quarantine began here? Uh, that's a good question. Just maybe the people that, that I invited to watch cuts, like my friends and my filmmaker friends that watched cuts. Uh, but no, it, it, it didn't have any public screenings or uh, even, you know, I don't think my agents had, had seen it or any, anything yet. Uh, we, I just finished the movie in February 
and then in March is when everything locked down. So it's it's tough to imagine for someone like me. It's tough to imagine what it's like to watch it for the very first time in a post pandemic world. Uh, it seems so different. What what sort of feedback or reactions or surprising comments have you gotten from the public that that have seen the film? Well, of course, I was nervous that it would just be too triggering, uh, too too sad, and too um, too close to what people are going through um, to to be to to engage with. Uh, so I was nervous about that for a long time. And even I didn't watch it for a long time. Like I said, I finished in February and then I don't think I watched it again until I had to for a DCP check in July. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was apprehensive, but then strangely enough, that was the best the movie ever played for me. And I don't know if that's because there was like four months in between when I <laughs> had seen it rather than just watching it every week. Or if it if it actually felt like the pandemic and and the, the the things that I was going through and now everyone has been going through made some of it just land differently and and feel like there was an additional layer of of drama or 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 relatability I don't know but but my own experience watching it that day made me feel a little bit better about releasing it. And sure enough, now that we've gotten some responses, like there are some people that are just like, it's too sad. Um, but the majority of, of people do seem to be receptive to, to having an experience where they get to see other people going through something similar to what we're all going through, like just focusing on their day-to-day, -day, focusing on the, the love that they have and the people that are most important to them. And uh, it's, it's playing as a somewhat cathartic experience to some, which is nice. Yeah. Again, in, in dire contrast to uh, uh, something like Contagion, you know, here you have that emotional relationship to the characters that really does feel like it's a, a necessary catharsis uh, uh, at this point, particularly so, you know, so long into a pandemic. Yeah. Um, I thought, I, you know, obviously everyone was like, when I was worried at first, everyone was like, but everyone's watching Contagion. And I was like, I think they're watching Contagion because they want tips on how to survive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like, I want this your manual for surviving yeah. a pandemic. Yeah. I was like, we don't have any tips except hold on to the ones you love. Yeah. And I mean, of course, there's also the haunting fact that the, the characters, with the exception of those who either you know, take their own lives or have accidents. They they stay they they live on mm -hmm. just without a sense of their identities, of their selves, and the yeah. people important to them. And that's haunting. I mean, that's um, so it's like it's a different kind of grief too. You know. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to just let the audience know that if you guys want to raise your hands or put questions in the Q and A box. I would be happy to bring you over to um, ask some questions live. So I'll give everyone a moment to sort of gather some questions. These are not necessarily students. It's just open to. Yeah, we so just like when we do things on campus, it's really nice to be able to open things to a wider uh, community around around USC or now in this case, actually, even uh, around the, the country or around the world. That That's actually you know, uh, when you look at some of the things that will take away from this experience, the ability to to have greater connection with alumni and, um, you know, people who don't live in Los Angeles, uh, that that will carry on. And I think that we'll actually yeah. have some sort of virtual programming, even when we're back in, in theaters, though, I, you know, obviously watching movies will always be my preference on the big screen. Yeah. Um, all right. This is always that moment between when I say I'm opening it up and people are forming no questions. questions. <laughs> so wait, tell me where you're opening theatrically though. Are you, are you going to play um, Vineland and Mission? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, we're we're in a lot of markets. Uh, so surprising, I didn't realize theaters were open in so many places. But uh, in the LA area, we're at two drive-ins. We're at the Vineland, which is like 40 minutes away, or maybe less, 30 minutes away. And then one called Arena right in Hollywood. Uh, it's a newer drive-in. So. Uh, oh yeah, what, what's the setup there? It's like in a parking lot in Hollywood, so it's small. I think it can only hold about 20 cars. Um, but, you know, can't beat the location. And um, it's good. I I'm going to go check it out there, you know, just to, just to see what it's like. Uh, all right, let me bring over Morgan, who has a question. All right, Morgan, fire away. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, thank you for coming and I loved the film. Oh, thanks. Uh, so I was just wondering, most of the film is from Emma's point of view. Um, and did you talk about that with Matson and Olivia? And why do you think her perspective is the right one to tell the majority of the story? Uh, I did not talk about it much with Matson. I just took it uh, at face value from his script that that was the correct choice. It made perfect sense to me. And I feel like in typical movies about someone with an affliction or a disability, or you know, if I think about a movie like Stronger with Jake Gyllenhaal, like those types of movies where it's about dealing with some new uh, crisis, there's always that character that is affected by it, but they're never given equal weight, um, or at least not in most of the movies that I can think of. So I, I love the idea of giving that character equal weight because it's hard to imagine which is worse. Would you rather be the person forgetting or would you rather be the person who has to watch your loved one forget you? It's a, it's a, a question I don't even know the answer to. So uh it just it just made sense and um but you know i always try to have actors feel like whatever part they're playing they're the star of the movie um so even raul and soko who play ben and samantha like when i'm talking to them i'm talking to them as if we're making the whole movie's about their characters mm -hmm. and from their character's point of view so um Jack probably does think the movie's from his POV. Don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the in the last 20 minutes, what I found interesting was that we do kind of like, arguably when we have like the least amount of him left is when it kind of switches and, and you kind of, he, you, we see him wake up in the morning and not really recognize her, which I thought was really cool as well. Yeah, thanks. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Are you a student at USC? I'm an alumnus. I graduated two years ago. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> graduated at just the right time. <laughs> I know. It's fantastic. <laughs> I've been very lucky, though, so it's all good. <laughs> you guys probably used to run into each other in Doheny all the time. Yeah. I know. that. That's what I was wondering when you said that, actually. I was wondering which library. I hope it wasn't Levy. I hope it was Doheny, because that's the way prettier one. <laughs> I think it is Levy. It's the one with all the bicycles and the right. In the oh, area. oh, OK. Yeah, that is Levy. I mean, people are working really hard there, that's for sure. But it's not as aesthetic as Doheny. <laughs> well, they need a little grunge. <laughs> yeah, but cool. Thanks, Morgan. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? Um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I wanted to ask if uh, if Jack was at all um, allowed to participate in the photography that his character creates. Uh, he was he was not, and in fact, <laughs> the the funniest thing is that there's the sequence in the nightclub. Uh, right before they have their first kiss, uh, waiting in line for the bathroom, where they're just dancing, and he takes a he takes a picture of her, and we shot it in in like 500 frames a second, super slow motion. So like every time we rolled, uh, we were wasting so much 
space on the on the hard drive and uh and also it was like really dark and we couldn't really see and he just did it he, he did it twice and we got the footage back and both times his finger is like directly in front of the lens of the camera <laughs> and so if you actually got that photo developed it would just be a smudge of his finger um so i think we ended up having to use something that wasn't even you know meant to be in, in the movie um mm. so needless to say he was not a photography expert um but he was he was eager to learn uh just too too late for him to be involved in the photography of the movie um tell us also about casting soko because you you bring in a real musician for for that role and it's sort of probably a, a little bit of unusual casting yeah except that she's great and so yeah. you know not not unusual and she she had I, acted sorry before. not unusual in that it's a weird performance <laughs> But that, you know, you think of like a casting call and sort of how you find actors. Yeah. Uh, I, I had been a fan of hers and, and in the script, in Matson's script, Ben was more of the musician. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a helicopter, I don't know, that's really loud. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ben was more of the musician and so it was kind of in the casting where I really, really wanted to work with Raul. I've known Raul for, for years and so uh, cast him first and he's not a musician so then we were like oh let's let's really get a musician for the Samantha part and uh, there was all these all these names on lists and and then someone or the casting director was like Soko read it and is interested and I had been a fan of hers for like 10 years also from music uh, but didn't know her as an actor but I'd, I saw that she had been in stuff. So I watched something called The Stopover and I was like, yeah, of course, this is, she's perfect. Um, I love her music, like her style is gonna fit the movie perfectly. And I knew that she could collaborate with Egan, our composer and come up with a song. So the song that is in the movie, uh, she helped co-write with Keegan. And um, can you hear my, my toddler singing Wheels on the Bus. <laughs> that I can hear. I didn't hear okay. the helicopter, but. <laughs> All right. um, uh, he's very uh, interested in hijacking this. Bring him on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, 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 it was important to have a, a musician in one of those parts. And then I was just greedy and really wanted Raul and, and then Soko both. And it worked out really perfectly. I would love to see uh, another movie that's just about them because they're, they're both great. Um, well, let me bring over Robert. And uh, since the audience is a little shy, if we don't have another one, then I'll, I'll uh, I'll seed you back to your toddler. <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I see plenty of him, it's fine. Okay, Robert, whenever you're ready. I'm gonna mute while, uh, until I have to. Hmm. Um, I really don't have a question, I just have comments. First of all, thank you, it was a wonderful film. Um, but the thing that kept going on with me during the film is I kept questioning my own memories because I'm at that age now where I'll watch a film and my best friend's an editor and we'll talk every day and I'll say, did you see this? And we'll talk about it and he'll say, what about the scene? I go, wait a minute, what scene? I will forget scenes. That I, well, I watch like five movies a day. So I forget what I saw. And of course, the other thing is with the memory thing, as you get older, um, being an actor, you start worrying about the lines and, you know, things like that. And I was sad every time uh, he would look at her and forget who she was. I mean, it hit me at my heart every time. Um, just the, you know, one of my dearest friends died of Alzheimer's and she got it early, like in her fifties. Mm. And actually she was an actress and worked quite a bit. Um, uh, so it all through the movie, I'm thinking about the whole memory thing. Um, and then the twist, you know, with her. And I remember saying out loud, oh my God, you know, it was like, but I, I love it. I love the twist because it's like 
I didn't want to, to figure out, which happens a lot. You figure out what's going to happen. And when you get it right, it's like, eh, I'm disappointed. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, but well, I really enjoyed the film. And you're an USC alumni, obviously. I'm not. Actually. Oh, you're not? No, I just, I just used the library. <laughs> oh, okay. But did you, did you like the scene with the horse on roller skates? The horse on rollers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I thought, when you said that, I thought he was going to test me there. But I was going to say, I thought it was a donkey. That's why it confused me. Yeah. No, but, I, went to, I went to film school in North Carolina. Uh, and when I, when I first moved to LA, my girlfriend was in the USC grad program for animation. Uh, so, so I lived near the campus with her. And, uh, you know, I just, for some reason, loved being around it and and then it's a great place i mean i i didn't go there i you know i studied with you know like stella adler and um but i've done a lot of usc films there Mm -hmm. yeah because you know they they do sag waivers and stuff so i've done a lot there in fact one of my dearest friends teaches there um i i hear that some of their alumni go on to do some pretty good things yeah well my friend he produced a lot of big movies and now he's you know he he teaches there he actually wrote a book something about um storytelling bruce block okay Uh, bruce bruce is yeah he directed me in a short film i wrote and you know um but anyway again thank you i really enjoyed the film and i called my best friend and i said you have to watch this because we keep talking about every movie we're watching it's they're so depressive this year depressing (laughs) this year yeah. And, you know, it's like I'm watching every foreign film and he's on the in the Academy and he votes for the foreign. And and um, I think the documentary is next that he's watching. But of course, I'm watching both now. Yeah. But anyway, um, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, Chad, I. I'm excited to stumble into you at some point in the book stacks. Um, But unfortunately, I think we're still several months away from that. Um, Mm -hmm. So theoretically, you might have the library to yourself right now. Um, Oh, don't tempt me. But uh, uh, thank you so much for for taking the time out to to talk with us tonight. Uh, I hope everyone will go out and recommend the film and those who can make it out to uh, the the new arena drive-in, is that? Yeah, it's arena in the lounge has become a drive-in. drive-in, or the Vineland. I, I yeah. I've been to the Vineland Vineland a bunch, and I really I really enjoy going out there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually you know been really uh, nice to see the revival of of the drive-ins. Um, yeah, so I, I hope we get to keep some of that culture alive as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I had never been. I don't think. Or, or my dad said maybe we went when I was really young and didn't remember, but. The pandemic is what got me to go to the ones in, in LA for the very first time. And it, uh, it's just like somehow really nice to just get like movie theater popcorn when you yeah. watch a film. You know, it's like yeah. you know, my Trader Joe's stuff is it's like it's too healthy. Yeah. So um thank you so much again and uh best wishes for the film. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll have you back when we're Sounds good. able to put stuff up on the big screen. And thank you to all you quiet. <laughs> Cheers. Um, Take care. Until next time. Bye. Take care.